What is the greatest genre of all time? We think it's documentaries. What exactly is a documentary? Well, in film, a documentary is simply a movie that provides a factual record or report. This definition leaves so much room for variety in the genre of documentary. We're taking a closer look into documentaries to prove to the world why this genre beats out the rest. After diving into the world of film, I discovered that there are 15 types of documentaries. Tim Dirks from Filmsite.org lists these types as well as the examples. The first type is the biographical films about a living or dead person, and some examples are Stephen Hawking, A Brief History of Time Made in 1992, Muhammad Ali, When We Were Kings, 1996. The following kind is a well-known historical event, and some examples are Night and Fog, 1955, Wacko, A New Revelation, 1999. The third kind is a concert or rock festival, also known as Rockumentary. Don't Look Back, 1967 is one example about Bob Dylan. Another example would be Monterey Pop, 1968. The fourth type is a comedy show, and some examples would be Kevin Hart, or Richard Pryor or Eddie Murphy shows. The following type is a live performance and some example would be Buena Vista Social Club 1998, Cirque du Soleil Journey of a Man 2000. The sixth type is a sociological or ethnographic examination following the lives of individuals over a period of time. An example will be Michael Apted's series of films 28 and Up 1984 and Steve James Hoop Dreams 1994. The seventh type is an expose including interviews. An example would be Roger and Me 1989, Fahrenheit 9-11 2004, and Sicko 2007. The eighth type is a sports documentary and an example would be The Endless Summer 1966, To the Limit 1989, and Extreme 1999. The ninth type is a compilation film of collected footage from government sources. An example would be Why We Fight 1943. The following type is an examination of a specific subject area. An example would be historical surveys conducted about jazz, baseball, or World War II. The eleventh type is nature or science related themes such as ethnographic natural history or wildlife films. And some examples would be Prairie 1954, Walt Disney's The Living Desert 1953. The 12th type is a making of film or behind the scenes. An example would be Burden of Dreams 1982, which is about the making of Fitzgerald 1982, and Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse 1991, which is about the making of Apocalypse Now 1979. The 13th type is a shock travelogue and an example would be Mondo Kane 1962. The following type would be mockumentary or docu-comedy and an example would be Man Bites Dog 1992 and Best in Show 2000. The final type would be pseudo-comedy and an example would be Citizen Kane 1941 which is about the newsreel on Kane and another example would be JFK 1991, which is a mixing of fact and fiction. After learning about the types of documentaries, we decided to hit the books and learn more about their history. The foundation of film began in 1877 when Edward Muybridge developed sequential photographs of horses in motion. In 1879, Moybridge invented the Zoa Praxiscope, which is a device for projecting and animating photographic images. In 1883, Itine Jules Mary experiments with chronophotography, which is the photography of people in movement. Documentaries started as short newsreels, 
instructional pictures, records of current events, or travelogues. It did not have any creative insight. The first creation of films are documentaries. The first documentaries were from the Lemire brothers who created a train entering a station and factory workers leaving a plant. In 1895, Felix Louis Renault films a Senegalese woman during the Paris Exposition, which is when they began the use of camera for ethnographic research footage. In 1907, documentaries developed a new image with the film The Unwritten Law. In 1919, Russian filmmaker Ziga Vertov issues a manifesto, Kinoko's Revolution Manifesto, calling for a new style of cinema that documents real life. Vertov criticized the film industry for relying on the same fictional techniques used by literature and theater. In his manifesto, he stated that rather than relying on fanciful scripts and artificial acting to focus on reporting the truth. In 1922, he begins to produce Kino Pravada, which literally means film truth which is a series of news reporting films that would develop further in documentaries with time. The first official documentary is Robert Flaherty's The Nuke of the North 1922, which is about an ethnographic look at the harsh life of Canadian Inuit Eskimos living in the Arctic. Some of the film scenes of obsolete customs were staged. The film employs many of the new techniques that would be used in later documentaries and ethnographic filmmaking. Techniques including the use of third-person narration and subjective tone. Flaherty is known as the father of documentary film. His landmark film is Moana, 1926. The term documentary was developed when reviewing this film. Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Schoedzak directed the landmark documentary Grass, A Nation's Battle for Life, 1925. It was the first documentary epic. In 1927, the film Chang, a drama of the wilderness, was the first part adventure and travel documentary. Between 1930 and 1937, the Workers Film and Photo League eventually changed to the Frontier Films in 1937 is formed in the U.S. with the purpose of making independent documentaries with a politically and socially progressive viewpoint. The government started using documentaries to make the public more aware of controversial issues. In 1935, the United States government made a documentary to keep American people informed about the New Deal and the necessities of its programs. It produced a new direction for American documentary filmmaking in terms of cinematic style and technical sophistication. In the 50s and 60s, documentary films were redefined with the invention of the newly developed lightweight handheld camera with synchronized sound. Young filmmakers began to strive for immediacy, spontaneity, and authenticity. They were aiming to bring the audience closer to the subject. In 1959, Drew Associates developed the first fully portable 16mm synchronized camera and sound system dedicated to furthering the use of film in journalism. The following year, Drew Associates produced Primary, the first film in which the sync sound motion picture camera is able to move freely with characters throughout a breaking story. Primary is widely regarded as the earliest example of American direct cinema. The first mockumentary to be created was in 1984 with This Is Spinal Tap. It was about a fictional heavy metal band. Fast forward to more recent times where commercially successful documentaries like Super Size Me, March of the Penguins, and An Inconvenient Truth have given nonfiction features a much broader reach and yielded bigger budgets for some documentary filmmakers. On the other hand, very affordable digital recording equipment now makes it possible for almost anyone to make a documentary. This guarantees a proliferation of non-fiction films, which will undoubtedly give rise to the development of new and highly individual styles of documentary filmmaking. In the world of film, documentaries are excellent sources for educational purposes or personal insight. Documentaries have been and continue to be used to enlighten viewers on topics and subjects that one may not have prior knowledge to or a predisposition that may be challenged. Documentaries can be a great platform to raise awareness about issues going on in the world today. An outstanding example of a company that makes films for that purpose would be Cambridge Documentary Films. 
Cambridge Documentary Films is a nonprofit organization founded by Renner Wonderlinch and co-directed by Margaret Lazarus. The organization is known for taking on topics that are commonly discussed in today's climate, but for a long time were taboo to talk about. Cambridge Documentary Films didn't shy away from bringing issues of sexism, racism, homophobia, rape, and many other social issues as focuses for their films. The organization developed in Massachusetts in 1974 and has produced 17 films since then. Most of their films are short, ranging from 15 minutes to about 45 minutes. In all of their films, Cambridge Documentary Films have been involved in the distribution. Unlike a lot of smaller companies that depend on others for distribution, Cambridge does it all by themselves. On their official website it says, most commonly filmmakers do not distribute their own work. We do because we want to stay in communication with the people who show and use our work. Being nonprofit, that's difficult to do successfully, but with donations and money out of pocket from the founders and executives, it is accomplished. They accept donations through their website and have an address listed in Santa Monica as well. All 17 of Cambridge Documentary Film documentaries have been met with great praise and positive critical reception. They won an Academy Award for Defending Our Lives, a documentary about the magnitude and severity of domestic violence in America. They've also had several films screened at places like the United Nations, General Assembly, the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives, the Office of the Vice Presidents, and numerous state legislatures. In an article from the Boston Globe in 2002, two critics gave reviews raving about the film Rape Is. Bella English states the film offers a somber, intense look at rape in all its forms. Child abuse, date rape, stranger rape, wartime rape, marital rape and prison rape. The viewer is taken from African war zones to American living rooms. Ultimately, the message is that rape is both a personal and political act. Dory Clark adds on by saying that it provides an emotional, honest look at rape in all of its forms, from war crimes to child abuse. Through interviews with legal experts, social service professionals, and rape survivors themselves, Lazarus and Wonderlich hit you in the gut with their powerful, thought-provoking films. Cambridge Documentary Films has been able to shed light on topics that are extremely relevant today. They have given a voice to those who are often silenced and have allowed their stories to be told. From the early 70s to present day, they have been consistent in their mission and have found great success because of it. From winning an Academy Award, along with many other awards, to having their work shown in places such as the White House, they have accomplished what many other companies have not been able to accomplish. To be a nonprofit organization as well is remarkable because it proves that everyone involved is involved out of the good in their hearts and have a passion for what they're doing. In a climate where using a platform like film to bring awareness to the struggles and challenges so many people go through is necessary, Cambridge Documentary Films takes full advantage and delivers effectively. We knew there had to be more information out there for why this genre is the best in film history. So we had to take things a step further. We sat down with the creative director at Glastown Productions to learn about his experience with documentaries. Documentaries give people the opportunity to learn about a real life story and learn about somebody's real life experiences, either somebody or a town or whatever it is. And it kind of, I think, um, empowers people to be more empathetic towards their fellow humans or whatever. And that's probably a lofty way of looking at what documentaries can do. But I, I, I really feel that way and I think that it's a great Documentary is a great art uh, platform to basically share the human experience. To understand his credibility, we wanted to know his career history and what drew him into documentaries. So I took, I took my first job as uh, an intern at a production company and quickly I became an editor there. And <clears throat> we, we were working on documentaries there, we were also working on commercials. And I actually went to my wife's hometown in Factoryville, Pennsylvania and went to something called Christy Mathewson Day, which is a, a day this town has celebrating this famous baseball player that came from their town. And the, when I went there, the parade was awesome. And like, there were all, like the whole town was in the parade, and maybe there was like 20 people watching it. And I thought, this is a great story. This, like, this is a town called Factoryville that no one's ever heard of, that literally the whole town is in this parade, and 
so no one's there to watch it. And I thought, I thought it was fascinating. So I talked to my wife and I said, I think this would be an awesome documentary. And it led me on this path of just wanting to tell positive community stories about slices of America that people don't typically hear about. When asked about his favorite documentary, he gave a few. One of his top films is Salesman, which follows a more traditional documentary style, but his other two were a little different. I really like documentaries that toy with the idea of what a documentary is. What I mean by that is something like Exit Through the Gift Shop or Room 237, which is about uh, some conspiracy theories about what, how The Shining was made, are really, really, really interesting because, yeah, they're documentaries, but they're also maybe not documentaries, or maybe they kind of play with the real life situation a little bit, and I, I really like when, when films do that. Finally, we wanted to know if there was anything that needed to be changed in this field. He didn't offer any alterations to the genre itself. Instead, he critiqued the production process. I wish that I could find a way to have documentaries just take less time to produce. Because I, uh, for the selfish re reason of I love creating stories and I like to move quickly so that I can get to the next story to tell. Um, and then for the not so, for the business reason, which is we produce um, a lot of documentaries here and the more that we produce, the better our company does. So I would love to find a way to kind of tighten that window and I'm always looking for efficiencies, but at the end of the day, it's a lot of legwork. And if there was a way to kind of shorten that legwork, uh, I think that would be a great thing. We learned the history behind documentaries. We learned what types there are. We did a case study on a production company. And we even interviewed someone working in this genre of film. With all of these sources joined together, it is clear why documentaries beat out the rest. It's one thing to watch a story unfold in front of your eyes like any other genre would do, but to learn more about that story, its history, and its meaning is more impactful and influential. They leave you thinking, and that is why documentary is the best genre.